it's a beautiful day and uh, again i would like to thank uh, red hat for uh, for having us here uh, much appreciated and the thanks to the community i think uh, we're all here uh, as part of the overall red hat community the open shift community right. so my name is ganesh ganesh janaki raman i uh, lead the saas operations and delivery team for broadcom and with me is uh, my colleague jose chavez who heads the platform engineering uh, for saas you may be wondering uh, what the heck is broadcom doing here right so broadcom is typically known for its uh, chip design hardware infrastructure uh, if you've not noticed uh, broadcom has been acquiring companies like uh, brocade ca technologies and uh, symantec uh, recently right so we have a multi billion dollar software business a thriving one at that uh, that encompasses infrastructure software enterprise software mainframes Uh, security software and we have a fairly large uh, presence in saas right so what uh, so both of us jose and myself we come from the ca acquisition so what we will talk about today is uh, our journey uh, with red hat openshift uh, where we started why did we even pick uh, openshift uh, where we are today what we are doing today and uh, where we are headed right so uh, this is a flashback of about 4 uh, to 5 years back uh in terms of uh, where we where this whole journey started for us um we were growing saas through acquisitions so there were several products that were coming to the saas table through acquisitions that were already pre baked pre built that was revenue uh, uh, generating products not greenfield ones that that we were absorbing right so the problem that we had was this uh, heterogeneous uh, uh sets of products that we had to run and operate um and uh, every each one of these uh, uh, was an island by itself uh and uh, the landscape looked something like this right so we had uh, we had products that uh, were built back in the late 90s early 2000s that were monolithic right so if you can recall the old uh, java j2e days uh, we had these massive war files uh, that that we used to run to the latest uh, uh, microservices uh, uh, based uh, products that that uses the latest technologies and tools right so the common uh, joke in the floor was that we literally had everything from pascal to haskell mm -hmm. and uh, c to r right uh, so we we literally ran ran, uh, ran everything right so the other important part is the the development methodology so we had products that were doing uh, your your old waterfall model and there were some that that were that were doing agile so eventually we kind of standardized on agile we, we follow the safe framework the reason why i bring that is uh, the delivery of the software the, the release management of the software were, were all totally different right the last part is the is the application infrastructure so some of these products uh, were built ground up multi tenant even 20 years back well architected uh, i wouldn't say the same about everything uh, some of these were actually hosted services they were they were not even true saas services some of them ran in our own data centers in private cloud and some of them were built public cloud native wherein they could consume uh, all of these uh, nice uh, elastic i mean i mean the only one swaying or <laughs> okay so uh, that could consume all these uh, new services that are available in in the in the public cloud so the 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 problem the the issue that we had the problem that we had was a problem of plenty a, a plethora a wide gamut of these products that we had to find a common way to run and operate okay we it was not possible for us to scale the resources both in terms of infrastructure as well as people to be able to manage these services sir so that was the problem that we that we uh, went about solving so so how could we uh, assimilate these products in a way wherein i don't need to linearly grow my teams right so the goals that we had for the saas delivery uh, were the following uh, as you can see um, Uh, we had to make it less complex uh, easy to manage and uh, reduce the operational costs right so obviously i mean it's 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 all driven from there and um, we were essentially looking for a common uh, operating model a common console where i can go look and and manage all of these products right so that's where uh, uh, you, uh, that's where openshift actually uh, uh, came into play i will so we in ca were one of the oldest partners of, of red hat in the openshift journey 
Uh, somebody talked about four and a three. We can talk about two as well, OpenShift version two. I don't know how many of you here have used OpenShift version two. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> OK, my, my commiserations, actually. <laughs> so if you've, we've dealt with uh, the cartridges uh, and gears, yeah, it was not fun to work with, right? So back in 2015, I think the pivot was made uh, to, to run, uh, to adopt Docker and Kubernetes. I think I'll be preaching to the choir here uh, if I start explaining the benefits of Docker and Kubernetes. But essentially, the, 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 the problem th that we wanted to solve, um, we said that if, you are, if you're a developer and if you're able to deliver your software in a box called this Docker image, okay, we need to find a way to, to run this in, a, in an orchestrated environment. right? So as long as the developers were able to come to this uh, uh, a form factor of, of software development, a unit for software delivery as a Docker image, we would take that, we will be able to run that in a, in a common model. So for us to start, stop, scale, the operations team does not need too much of expertise on the product to, to manage these diverse technologies. As long as they're able to, uh, they, they know OpenShift and they're able to manage the platform, we should, we should, be, good to, we should be good to manage these, right? And the other thing, uh, the important thing I, I think I mentioned in the, in the earlier slide was the was an edict. I think uh, my my early the earlier speaker talked about uh, ing. We had to automate everything. That was the, that was one of the ground rules, right? From automating everything to uh, we are at a point where we are moving towards a declarative everything, where everything needs to be de uh, declared uh, in Git, and that's what triggers the automation. So Jose will will talk more uh, uh, more more on that. And uh, today we run OpenShift in. We run large clusters of, of, of OpenShift, both in our private cloud and different public clouds. And we are in the process of uh, consolidating them, uh, but we still do see a need for, for having a combination of both. I'll talk about, a little bit about the scale in, a, in, a, in the later part of the presentation. And uh, I think similar to what the ING use case was, we run our service in a, highly, in a, in a high security environment, so we need to go through the, the, the InfoSec regime. We have uh, all our environments are SOC 2 certified. We have a couple of environments that are PCI certified, so we do we do have a FedRAM setup as well, right? So that gives you an idea of the the scale uh, that we are running. So without much ado, I'd, I'd request my colleague Jose to talk about the uh, the technology stack, uh, what we run at a, at a high level, and uh, take it from there. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, guys. Okay. So our technology stack, obviously. Uh, running in production, there's some uh, common components that uh, would need to be incorporated, starting with the uh, infrastructure layer. Um, as shown here, uh, various cloud providers, um, VMware could be uh, put in there as well. Uh, the ultimate goal was to be as flexible as possible and you know, where we could deploy to. So starting with that layer, then adding OpenShift on top of that uh, with Docker and Kubernetes uh, uh, to host our services, of course. Um, and uh, some of the SaaS applications uh, that we're hosting on top of uh, OpenShift, the um, that are broad, you know, Broadcom um, IP, the AI Ops, uh, API Management, CVD, uh, Atomic, MRA, PPM, um, more to come. Then, in order to support those services, um, we had to have, um, you know, infrastructure services as well. On the left-hand side, you have your monitoring uh, pieces. Again, uh, Broadcom actual applications, APM, ASM, UIM, DOI. Um, to the right of the SaaS applications, uh, you would have your uh, common services uh, that are like you know integration or needed by the, uh, the actual SaaS uh, uh, services like uh, Kafka and uh, Zookeeper. Then we have our logging uh, stack uh, based on um, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, with uh, some file beat agents that are essentially scraping uh, the logs and you know forwarding them onto uh, Elasticsearch. Um, it is actually running uh, as a stateful set. Uh, Elasticsearch is, and just by a show of hands, um, who runs you know stateful sets in production today? Okay. So yeah, that, that was one of the concerns for us is you know, a lot of the reading that uh, we had been doing was you know, yeah, stateful sets uh, for like database uh, technologies like MySQL, Postgres, things like that are good for development purposes. Um, but once you uh, incorporate basically uh, shared resources, um, there, there's a risk involved there you know, with performance and things like that. So that's kind of a leap of faith we had to take with, uh, with Elasticsearch, um, but it's worked out so far. Um, we have our uh, 
you know, our DB layer, uh, as shown here, uh, Mongo, Postgres, and MySQL. I'll talk a little bit more about the, where we're going with those. Um, uh, right here, they're depicted as standalone services. And then, of course, um, you can't be without security. So, uh, you know, Qualys um, for auth scans, Twistlock for uh, scanning uh, container images. Uh, you have your uh, alert logic uh, for network, you know, packet inspection. Uh, and then, of course, semantic for antivirus. So that pretty much summarizes uh, what our uh, current generation stack looks like today. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Ganesh, uh, to go into more detail about the workloads that we run in production today. So we've been running uh, OpenShift, uh, uh, the, the, the 3.x OpenShift. I think the first version we went live was 3.1. We quickly moved to 3.4. Uh, we went live 2016 November. It's been three years, actually. Uh, right now, most of the production workload we have is in 3.11, and uh, we are testing four actively, and we should be there someday. Uh, the kind of applications uh, uh, that we run, again, uh, I kind of uh, already talked about the, the breadth. Right? So we have a lot of web applications, as you may guess. Again, different hues. We run everything. We run some your Nginx, Apache, uh, HA proxy kind of. I mean, we have, like, you, you name it. So the important thing that we... Uh, from what I recall from my pre-OpenShift to where we are today, is our ability to scale, right? So with, uh, we, uh, we are able to scale uh, dynamically uh, based, on the, uh, based on the number of requests. We are able to scale up, scale down uh, as needed. And I think uh, the support from Kubernetes there uh, has helped us enormously in terms of uh, managing these, these, these web app, uh, the web apps, which used to need operators going and spinning up VMs and uh, when they were, when after, the, after the Cyber Monday is over, scaling them back. So we don't need to do any of these uh, uh, right now. So we have uh, the other workloads like project and portfolio management and continuous delivery management. These are large uh, database inst intensive, um, more of a workflow uh, uh, management kind of uh, uh, applications. The, uh, again, the most important uh, part that we achieved with OpenShift was literally we run thousands of containers. Okay? We run thousands of containers just for, for these, these kind of workloads. And uh, the, the, the staff, the operational staff that we needed to manage these right, was, was enormous. The kind of the operational efficiencies that we've achieved by moving these workloads into containers is, is, is amazing. Uh, uh, both from a resiliency perspective, self-healing, the, uh, the, the ability for these applications to recover, I think that alone uh, I mean, has helped us tremendously, actually. Then we also run a, a, a data science platform where we have these workloads. Uh, there's a lot of machine learning uh, and, and AI uh, that we do for, for different products. So one of the products that we have is the payment security uh, platform. We run the largest online authentication uh, system. Uh, it used to be a protocol called Verified by Visa or MasterCard Secure Code, if you're familiar. So we run that, uh, that workload. And that, uh, so there's a real-time um, fraud detection uh, that we do. Uh, uh, that that uh, that that uses that, that uses OpenShift as well. Again, this is uh, the ML AI here is more uh, homegrown proprietary. It's not uh, uh, any of your TensorFlow, but again, uh, the, this this one runs in our OpenShift platform too. And then we have uh, other enterprise security applications. Uh, again, we have uh, uh, applications like API gateways, uh, API management portal, and and, and things like that. And uh, Jose talked about analytics. We run uh, when we started this journey. Uh, we were uh, kind of hesitant to do uh, uh, anything on the on the on the stateful applications. Uh, we we are still running them on, in, on VMs. Uh, recently, it's been like about over six months now. I think we moved completely to stateful sets, and then the whole new storage class uh, uh, has helped us uh, a big time uh, uh, there as well. So we run uh, our complete Elasticsearch and Hadoop to a small scale. Uh, we have some Spark workloads that uh, that, that we run. On a, on a very small scale, uh, as uh, uh, in, the, in the in the OpenShift environment as well. And the last one I, I kind of mentioned uh, in the earlier slide about AI operations. AI operations is basically um, uh, a suite of, of monitoring tools that we actually run, uh, that we host on behalf of our customers. We use it, we use it internally as well. So this is uh, uh, this is again. Um, um, uh, a, a very useful part of our overall platform, wherein we have this monitoring both inside out and outside in that we do. So when I say outside in, uh, we have pops that are running all over the world, and those that are not running on OpenShip, uh, that kind of monitors and uh, sends, uh, sends metrics. And we have, uh, uh, we have um, uh, 
Netflow, flow, uh, net flow analysis uh, uh, that, that we can do. And we, can, uh, we do have application performance uh, uh, management that goes in right uh, to, to your container, to your pod, uh, to your service, uh, to your, to your, to your, to your uh, namespace, and then to your cluster. Right? And there is the other microservice versus the, the application view. So there are different uh, levels of, of monitoring and metrics that it collects. Uh, and uh, there is an AI engine that actually does the correlation. And that gives us a, a very good visibility into what's uh, going on, uh, on on the environment. So the other part that we wanted to talk about uh, today is, uh, I think uh, uh, the earlier speaker kind of touched upon uh, this one as well, in terms of how we manage this, this environment, what kind of automation we have uh, to, to make sure that we have a, uh, automated provisioning, uh, separate out the infrastructure provisioning and the application provisioning and the application deployments. So Jose will talk about uh, what we do uh, on, that, on, on the automation on the CD side. Right. Over to you. Okay, so thinking about the uh, technology stack that I um, showed earlier, um, you know, as you start to build these out, um, you, you realize how much you know, effort, you know, time goes into uh, building even just one uh, stack. And if you want to be able to scale, obviously the importance of automation comes in. Um, so you know, as the product evolved, uh, as the, uh, the common stack uh, that we call it um, evolved, we started to introduce new, new tools, new processes to make the job easier and also, um, you know, obviously be able to keep up with uh, the demand of building out multiple uh, environments as, as more and more uh, teams or services were introduced. So the uh, provisioner, this is more of a high level and I'll go into more detail in a minute, but uh, we leveraged uh, a Packer to start building out, um, you know, whether it was like an AWS image, or VMware image, uh, Google image. Um, we had some standards or some security practices that we wanted to apply uh, to the images, basically creating like a, a standard or golden image, if you will, and then leveraging it as part of the provisioning process that would get fed into um, ultimately like the instances that would get spun up um, in the VPC. And that's what that uh, kind of bottom uh, layer shows there. Um, and uh, basically let, you know, deploying or distributing that image uh, to the various uh, uh, GCP or AWS uh, accounts uh, in order to leverage it for deploying via uh, Terraform. So you can see here, the, the end result is being able to deploy um, the, the full stack, the infrastructure, you know, the, the uh, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, OpenShift platform on top of uh, the various cloud providers. So, Here's uh, basically a couple of use cases that uh, we identified when we were you know, building out this uh, latest generation of what we call the, um, the, our deployer platform provisioning, uh, the GitOps way. Um, it was actually before we realized we were doing it the GitOps way, but ultimately uh, we used Git as the, uh, you know, the source of truth, if you will, for um, uh, storing uh, you know, like various input files that um, have all the uh, configurations about the stack, um, the uh, the state file that's needed for tracking. Essentially, everything you needed to to build the stack, to identify its state, um, and you know be able to expand on that uh, stack. So, um, on the upper left where you show Git, it's more of an automated flow um, going through where somebody does a Git commit um, with the state they want. They ultimately do um, a Terraform apply, you know, plan apply. And that kicks off uh, deployment, whether it's on, in cloud or you know um, on-prem, you know, like a VMware type deployment. But it goes through the whole flow, leveraging um, you know Ansible as one of the core pieces there. Um, and the the key part there is when you build a stack, not all stacks are going to be built the same, so you need the flexibility uh, to alter the size, right? And uh, we designed it in such a way that you could, you know, there's a set of defaults, uh, but you can um, you know modify. How many OpenShift nodes, you know, masters, you know, utility servers you ultimately need in the stack, um, and since it's, you know, a different Git repo for each stack, you can uh, manage those separately. Um, but we also realized that uh, there was a need for testing as well, quick, you know, iterative uh, testing of your, you know, our own code uh, and our own automation, um, which is the, uh, the the lower le left hand side uh, workflow, if you will. 
Um, and, and that's simply you know, a developer doing a, a, a git pool, modifying his changes, then pushing those out to you know, like a testing environment, if you will, um, and, and being able to repeat that process. Um, but ultimately, through a combination of uh, you know, Ansible um, and Terraform, we're able to spin up stacks you know, pretty much as quickly as the uh, cloud vendor allows. Um, and uh, of varying sizes, and uh, it's all pretty straightforward. And um, you know, it, it's easy to kind of uh, train like new individuals that aren't used to um, automation of uh, you know infrastructure to say, hey, here's here's what we have kind of packaged uh, as a deployer. This is really how you use it, even if you don't uh, necessarily need or want to understand the inner workings. Uh, and that was the goal. So that was for the platform deployment, but you also have the services deployment side of things. Uh, again, here we actually uh, use um, Git as the, the source of truth as well. Um, in this particular case, you know, uh, it, it, pretty much every development team has their own form of CI. Um, we give them the flexibility to, to build and automate how they you know, compile and ultimately do you know, their, their uh, local testing and building of artifacts. But once they're ready to actually test in our uh, sandbox environment that we provide for them or even go into the deployment, um, they effectively do a git commit, which uh, triggers uh, this whole CD pipeline flow. Um, part of the git commit um, you know, specifies things like um, your target environment, um, the services uh, that you want to deploy, um, and uh, you know, exposed ports, things like that. You know, the, the common uh, attributes that you would find um, uh, that describe your service and how it's going to be rolled out. Um, and we support uh, Docker Compose uh, format as input, but we're actually focused more on the Helm side now. Um, and just by a show of hands, who here uses, um, you know, Helm for the majority of their deployments? Helm, oh, okay. So yeah, that's uh, actually one of the newer features we introduced into um, our, our CD pipeline and support for Helm. And, uh, um, but ultimately, the flow is uh, user uh, um, commits uh, you know, um, a change to the input file, a Helm chart, you know, um, a Docker image uh, in something like Artifactory. And uh, we pick it up. You know, we copy it into our own local space. We want to do a security scan of that Docker image. Uh, make sure it meets the standards that that we've set, and there's no like glaring, you know, critical issues there. Um, and uh, we use Twistlock to scan those images and provide any feedback. You can put gates in place, security gates, so that you know if there are vulnerabilities, you can actually fail the pipeline right there and send back the report. Um, if it if it turns out it's good, it passes the uh, the security scans, uh, then it goes and syncs with uh, um, with Bintray, um, and uh, because Artifactory is actually, you know, only accessible internally, we needed a way to access Docker images externally. Bintray stores that, and then ultimately, we um, the deployer communicates with the endpoint OpenShift service, and uh, you know tells it, it it's ready to uh, pick up the images from Bintray uh, into the uh, local registry in OpenShift, and uh, ultimately deploy those services. So, I mean, the, the bottom line here is that we wanted to empower developers. Uh, you know, to deploy on their own schedule, you know, whether it's, you know, once a day, once a week, you know, a month, whatever it was, um, without actually getting in the way, you know, having operation, the typical operations model um, where they have to wait a certain period of time in order to get these deployments out. So now they're, it's literally on their, you know, on their schedule. There's still security um, uh, gates in place as well. Um, where you know this pipeline um, is part of the input, they can uh, dictate um, approve like an approver chain, if you will. Um, and when they submit, it has to go through like a couple layers of approvals. And finally, uh, if those are approved through the pipeline, it, it ends up getting deployed into uh, production. And one of the other important pieces that ties into here, it's not uh, actually mentioned, is. Uh, if it is in a production environment, you want to have a paper trail of what's what's happening. We integrate with ServiceNow, create a ticket, put the necessary details in there, ultimately close the ticket and deploy. So that's all tracked uh, and audited. Um, but you can see on the right-hand side, 
it doesn't matter what type, uh, where OpenShift is running, as long as we can reach it through a network, um, we can actually deploy to it. So whether it's on the cloud or it's on-prem. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it there. Okay, so we've kind of talked about where we've been, um, where we are today, uh, but where are we headed, right? So where we see ourselves in the next you know, three, six months, um, we want to be able to leverage um, operators uh, to manage the life cycle of services like Postgres, you know, MySQL, uh, Kafka. Uh, those are going to be critical for us. Um, we want to start providing uh, essentially self -service, uh, a self-service model for uh, development teams to be able to plug in um, or, or bring in uh, you know, database technologies, for example, uh, quickly without having to wait for the traditional, uh, let's you know, get some infrastructure and deploy the uh, database there. Number one, it's time consuming. Two, it doesn't scale well. Um, and, and three, if you can have operators actually managing the full life cycle of that, it simplifies things, right? It's part of the, the uh, whole automation story. Um, so that's one, uh, one big piece. The other thing is, you know, we want developers to focus on what they're good at doing, right? Developing services and not focused on actually how they deploy, um, you know, like a Kafka cluster, Zookeeper cluster, things like that, right? And that can be time consuming. Um, th their time can be better spent elsewhere. Uh, so uh, I think that uh, that operator story kind of uh, blends in well with that. Um, uh, we want to incorporate a service mesh for multiple reasons, uh, but uh, one of them being, uh, you know, we want to standardize on, uh, you know, the security model there. Um, and finally, uh, multi-cluster management for various reasons, but uh, uh, we definitely see the, the benefits of that and having a single, you know, pane of view, if you will, um, for how things are operating, especially, you know, the health of, uh, you know, uh, clusters excuse me, uh, health of clusters, um, and even like uh, chargeback, you know, um, modeling uh, usage and things like that. It's uh, definitely beneficial. So I know, Diane, uh, you were looking for some uh, honest feedback. Uh, so I just put a couple of things here. Ganesh, uh, feel free to add anything else uh, uh, that you see fit. But, Basically, we just wanted to uh, highlight, um, you know, we're hoping that, uh, you know, Red Hat can um, you know, bring some, you know, focus back to uh, OKD on 4.x. Uh, right now, we're running on uh, 3.11, um, but there's definitely features, including, uh, you know, some of the newer um, operator features that uh, we want to take advantage of, um, uh, you know, node management um, and uh, patching and things like that, so, uh, and, and definitely the, the chargeback stuff. Um, one of uh, my engineers actually um, made a comment that uh, he was trying to install code-ready containers, OpenShift 4.2, on his local laptop, and it consumed like 20 gigs of memory, which brought it to a crawl. So, um, you know, uh, maybe uh, take take a look at that. And, you know, it, we're looking for a similar experience to like you know how MiniShift operated. It is a pretty quick, very small install, uh, and ultimately simplify the upgrade process, which I know that you guys are kind of working on, but we haven't seen yet with the OKD. So anything else, Finish? That's it. So.